their unsuccessful applications to see what they can do for the young people of Scotland. And I will encourage Creative Scotland to engage with the member. We now move straight on to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Joanne Lamont. Thank you. Last week, when he sprang to the defence of his Health Secretary, the First Minister revealed something that a lot of us had suspected for some time. He said, and I quote, I am in on everything. If he really is in on everything, can the First Minister tell us why Alex Neil reversed the decision taken by Nicola Sturgeon on mental health service in Lanarkshire? And could he explain if Alec Neil was acting in the best interests of patients in Lanarkshire, what was Nicola Sturgeon doing? Well, First Minister. Every health secretary has the right when taking office to review a whole range of decisions. Uh, Joanne Lamb is quite right. Uh, this is about health provision in Lanarkshire. That affects 500,000 people. And the health secretary was well within his rights uh, to look at health provision in Lanarkshire, the particular pros, uh, proposals that were coming forward, uh, and make his, his views known. And when he made his views known, he made his view there should be provision uh, in Monklands, in Wishaw and Hare Myers, uh, in the, the three hospitals concerned. That's what he said in the memo of the 26th September. Uh, and I think that's what a health sector is well within his rights to do that. And he discharged his responsibilities and he was acting in the best interests of the health service of Scotland. So we have the unusual situation where both Alex Neil and Alex Salmond agree that Nicola Sturgeon got this wrong. Who else, who else does the First Minister think got this wrong? Ian Ross, Chief Executive of NHS Lanarkshire, on the very morning he was instructed by Alec Neil's office to reverse his plan, was still insisting that the original proposals would mean, quote, improved quality of service to patients. He said there is no alternative option which can deliver the same benefits. Katrina Borland, a senior official in the government's own health team, said retaining beds at Monkland would result in a less than optimal service. So can the First Minister explain why health professionals wasted two years trying to re redesign a service if it was not in the interests of patients? Yeah, yeah. First Minister. Well, uh, 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 I'm not sure if uh, John Lambert is aware that the proposals of 2006, mm -hmm. uh, which were approved by her uh, health team, uh, when she was uh, actually a member of, of the government, actually proposed having an acute ward in Monklands Hospital. So I could equally ask, why was it that her, the government of which she was a, a member approved that formulation and now she criticises the Health Secretary for agreeing with her? I find it quite extraordinary that that lapse of memory has crept in uh, to Joanne Lamont's uh, articulation. But there are other considerations that have to be borne in mind. Order. Order, Mr. And she's quite right. Uh, the, there's a, a letter which I, I know is, uh, is known to Joanne Lamott since it was released under FOI. Obviously, it's uh, for understandable reasons a confidential letter. But the letter was actually uh, written to me. Uh, and that was a letter from a patient. Uh, and I found it then, and I find it now, uh, a very moving account of why that patient did not agree that this ward should be closed. That patient said, the nurses in the wards know us personally over many years, as long as 20, and that's a long time. We as patients are bonded with these nurses in such a way as we trust them with our lives. Many mentally ill patients can't read or write, but we know that these wards should stay open. Families are much concerned at the best of times. They visit us when they finish work and work long hours too. Ask yourself this, if one of your own family was ill, after working 12-hour shift, then have to travel at least 15 miles and all hours without public transport being available, could you do it? You should keep it Order. open for the mentally ill. Now, that, that was a letter. Well, I think that is a, a moving letter that should be listened to with respect by this chamber. Order. That was a letter written in September 2012 by one of the patients who was particularly concerned about rumours about the ward. Ms. McMahon. I think it's entirely reasonable 
for the Government to take these opinions into account and entirely reasonable for a Health Secretary to discharge his responsibility in the way that Alec Neil did. John Lomond. So for the absence of doubt, the First Minister does believe the Nicola Sturgeon got it wrong. He believes that Scotland's most senior health officials got it wrong. And of course, we should listen to patients and users. So what does the First Minister say about Francis Fallon? Mr Fallon is the chair of Lanarkshire Lynx, which advocates on behalf of 800 mental health service users and carers. And Mr Fallon has said, and I quote, the members of Lanarkshire Lynx were totally shocked, bewildered and very upset about this decision. Taken in a spur of the moment, knee-jerk reaction by Mr Neil, without any discussion or consideration of those hundreds of service users and their carers. Mr Fallon was a mental health nurse for 30 years. He was given an MBE for his work on mental health. He spent two years with his colleagues working on this proposal, only to be ignored. What does the First Minister have to say to him and his members, let down by Alec Neil? First Minister. Uh, I've read out uh, a moving letter from a patient uh, who was frightened uh, by being affected by the proposals as, as well. Uh, and that was one of the interests that were taken into account, quite rightly, by the Health Secretary. What the Health Secretary sent back to, uh, through his officials to the Board was to look at the provision across Lanarkshire, across three of the hospitals. Uh, many of us believe uh, that these matters about local provision are really important, important in mental health services and across the the range of health services. The configuration that Lanarkshire has now, they are confident as a board, is going to offer excellent provision for the people of Lanarkshire. That involves uh, acute facilities at Air Myers, at Wishaw and at Monklands. It also involves an expansion of services in the community. That seems to me a, a good position for the people of Lanarkshire. And these are the things that quite properly are taken into account as indeed they were taken into account in other hospital situations in Lanarkshire. That is the thing that health secretaries are elected to do, to discharge... Well, a health secretary discharges responsibilities to all the patients of Lanarkshire. There is a great, there is a great deal of opinion that the formulation, the circumstance that we come out with, uh, is an excellent provision as far as mental services are concerned. And it is really important that these patients, as made in the point made in the letter, who are not always the patients with the strongest voices, when they make their opinions heard, these voices are listened to with respect. That's what the Health Secretary did, and I think he should be proud of his actions in that respect. I don't know what is more depressing, that the First Minister makes that case, he makes that case, or that he actually thinks it's a credible case to make in the situation he's in. This is desperate stuff, because for two years, his Cabinet Secretary Nicola Sturgeon, the board, the patients, the staff, people who cared for folk with um, mental health issues, people who used them service themselves, came to one conclusion and Alec Neil came to a different one. So, presiding officer, one week into this, we have still to hear a credible explanation for Alec Neil's behaviour. Let's look at what I believe is his charge sheet, putting his political interests before patients, guilty, undermining the integrity of health professionals, guilty, and misleading this parliament and the people Ms. of Lamont. Scotland. In my Ms. view, in Ms. my Lamont. view, as I said... Ms. Lamont. Misleading is not acceptable within First Minister's questions. I will ask other people to judge an email which directs the Health Board to do one thing in the morning and for the afternoon the, the Minister to claim that he has stepped back. Is the First Minister really prepared to debase his own office and this Parliament even further to save the skin of his health secretary? First Minister. It is, of course, 
perfectly reasonable for Joanne Lamont to disagree with the decision that the Health uh, Secretary and the valuation that he made. That's perfectly reasonable. It is uh, perfectly reasonable for her to point out that different people have different opinions. Uh, although I've heard nothing as to why the government of which she was a member in 2006 considered there should be acute facilities in Monklands Hospital. Presumably all of that expertise and advice was available in 2006 when a different proposal and conclusion were coming forward. I will be uh, reading extensively uh, from a document uh, when we get to the debate in a few minutes' time, which demonstrates beyond any doubt whatsoever that the, this fact and these facts and all of these facts were volunteered by the government as... Well, maybe I should... Uh, Maybe Order. I should read from it now. Order. It's a document of the 1st December 2012, released to John Pentland, MSP, on the 5th of March last year. Every iota of this information was available to Joanne Lamont's MSPs last March. Well, I hear no, it was not. I hope Richard Simpson stays here for the debate, yes. because, yes, indeed, it was. Mr, Mr. Simpson. Simpson. But in terms of what people will Mr. judge... Simpson. Can I say this to the Labour leader? Uh, at a time uh, when people are rightfully concerned that the Labour Party may be planning to remove free prescriptions from the National Health Service, at a time when people are concerned Order. with the open questioning of free personal care by the Labour Party, at a time when people are concerned they're Order. going to reintroduce tuition fees to have this spurious motion of no confidence when people are debating and looking at the great to face the country. Order. And it won't be a judgment on Alec Neil, it'll be a judgment on this pathetic opposition. Ruth Davidson. Order. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. Uh, and no plans uh, near future. Ruth Davidson. Presiding Officer, the SNP's case for independence, as contained in its white paper, relies heavily on oil income. But the figures quoted within it are now massively out of date and need refreshed. Fourteen months ago, in the government's oil analysis, John Swinney promised regular updates on oil projections. He hasn't delivered. Eight weeks ago today, he promised my colleague Gavin Brown in this chamber a fresh analysis of Scotland's oil production income within weeks. Nearly two months on, still silence from this government. Last year, the difference between the SNP's projected income from oil and what was actually collected was nearly £3 billion. The SNP has a duty to tell people how they would balance the books in an independent Scotland. Instead, all we've had is promises of updates month after month and week after week. If they haven't done a fresh analysis, why not? And if they have, why won't they publish? Yeah. Well, First the, Minister. Uh, analysis uh, will be released uh, as Mr Swinney uh, committed himself to. I think uh, Ruth Davidson should be very careful what she wishes for uh, in these matters. And that analysis is released. It will examine the UK government's track record in forecasting oil revenues, uh, not just over the last few years, but over the last 30 to 40 years. If we'd believed the Conservative Party on the subject of Scotland's oil, it would all have been finished more than 10 years yeah. ago, was the forecast of the Conservative spokesperson. So when that uh, forecast comes out, it will look at the credibility of an OBR that suggests that oil prices will be less than $100 a barrel when they're currently 110 dollars a barrel. They'll look at the credibility of an oil price forecast from the OBR, which says under $100 a barrel when the Department of Energy and Climate Change is saying pushing towards $130 a barrel. It'll look at the huge surge of investment of £13 billion sterling in the North Sea, which of course has taken off current oil revenues because of the allowance against capital investment, but is there to increase future oil production and therefore revenues. And it will recognise that over the next 40 to 50 years, there are massive quantities 
shortages of oil and gas to come from the Scottish sector of the North Sea, but there is a fundamental question. Will it go as the last 40 years and disappear into the maw of the London Treasury, or will it use to be invested in the economy and future life chances of the people of Scotland? Ms Davidson. More Blythe assurances after eight weeks of similar. And it's not just me that's asking, because the Scottish Parliament's own information service asked the government for answers two weeks ago and were told soon. Then they ask last week and were told soon. In better times, when the SNP was keen to shine a light on oil figures, they pulled civil servants in over the weekend to publish a report. Now that the news isn't so good, they seem to be dragging their feet. The OBR has changed its figures. The oil and gas industry has also revised down its production, its estimates downwards. But the Scottish Government continues to deny reality. People want clarity. But the First Minister has stalled in giving it because if he did, it would blow yet another hole in his independence white paper. So isn't the reason that John Swinney is refusing to honour his months-long commitment of promises of updates on these oil figures because it wrecks the SNP's key case for independence. First Minister. Uh, no, no, it's not. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, it would be uh, extremely difficult to keep up with the changes in the OBR figures uh, since they, they change more often than the, the weather changes uh, as far as oil forecasts uh, are concerned. I pointed out in my first answer some of the substantial difficulties with the OBR figures and how they are incompatible with other figures produced by the UK government in terms of forecasts uh, and oil prices. But I think the most important underlying point to get across here is the massive investment that's taking place currently in the waters around Scotland. Now, it could be, of course, all of these huge international and domestic oil companies are investing because they don't believe that there's any more oil and gas left in the North Sea. They, they believe the OBR. The OBR, who says that production will be absolutely flat and won't increase at all thanks to that investment, they could be investing all of these funds for no return whatsoever. Or we could make the conclusion that if oil companies are investing £13 billion in the waters yeah. around Scotland, then it's probably in the expectation that oil production is going to rise. And as oil production rises, guess what? The revenues rise. But then, of course, we come back to the question, where are these revenues going to go? Are they going to disappear into George Osborne's coffers for election campaigns, or are they going to be used to benefit the people of Scotland? I say the people of Scotland should have our turn after 40 years of the London Treasury having theirs. Lewis MacDonald, supplementary. Thank you very much. The First Minister will be aware of today's announcement that All Energy, the biggest renewable energy conference in these islands, is set to leave Aberdeen after 13 years of success and 13 years of year-on-year -year growth, uh, bringing this year £4 million to the local economy. Can the First Minister tell us when he first became aware of this plan and what he did to prevent it? First Minister. Well, the our officials have discussions uh, all the time. I mean, I've had the great honour of participating in that conference uh, on many uh, occasions. I, I think it's really important that we do everything possible uh, to foster renewable conferences wherever and whenever. But, of course, that means carrying through on the commitments that this government has made, with, I hope, support from Lewis MacDonald on the importance of offshore investment in renewables. Because, interestingly enough, as this government's commitment to renewables has been declared and applauded time and time again, we haven't always had the same consistency of approach from his party and even less uh, from the Conservative Party. So yes, we'll work to retain conferences in Aberdeen, which I believe should be seen as the, not just the oil capital of Europe, but the energy capital of Europe. And, of course, as Lewis MacDonald well knows, in an independent Scotland, the administration and regulation of the energy industry would be committed from Aberdeen. Question three, Willard Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, issues are of importance to the people of Scotland. Willard Rennie. There has been much concern that since this Government came to power, the use of police stop and search has increased fourfold. The response from Kenny McCaskill, don't look at me, I'm only the Justice Secretary. 
Now there's a big increase in police permanently carrying guns. The Justice Secretary says, who cares, ask someone else. Tearing apart the long-cherished character of Scottish policing is being met by casual indifference. Does the First Minister care? First Minister. Well, I, I don't accept that uh, depiction of the response of the Justice Secretary, which I, I read in the, in the record this, uh, this very morning. Uh, I mean the record of Parliament, not the, the daily record. I'm sure the, the daily record reported them uh, accurately and more accurately than the depiction by, uh, uh, by the Liberal Democrats. I was very struck by another article that appeared, uh, and I would ask Willie Rennie to consider it, because it was from Hugh Riley, who obviously is a journalist, but uh, speaks with some authority as a, a former officer. Uh, and what he said in The Scotsman of 19th May, quote, a minority of Scottish officers bear firearms while in routine business. But this is hardly the scare story some are making it out to be. Instead of sniping, politicians and others should put things into perspective. There are more than 17,000 police officers, of whom less than 3 per cent are armed, hardly the stuff of a police state. Unfortunately, the operational decision made by the head of Police Scotland, Sir Stephen House, to prevent any unnecessary hold-up in armed officers arriving at firearms instance has been turned into a political football. Uh, not my words, but the words of a respected Scotsman journalist. But I do think that Willie Rennie and others would do well to bear them in mind as they are addressing this important issue. Well, Rennie. He, he needs to recognise that the policy has changed. Police Scotland has admitted, Police Scotland has admitted that more armed police officers are ready and armed at all times, even on normal duties. So we now have more police carrying guns at road traffic accidents, more police carrying guns controlling crowds outside nightclubs, and carrying guns when stopping and searching children. On his watch, they, they do not know what is happening on their watch. They need to take this much more seriously than they are. The relationship between the police and the public is at risk, but he says it is nothing to do with him. It was supposed to be that having guns was exceptional. Now it is being normalised. If he won't act, will he at least appoint an independent reviewer to look at the use of guns by the police? First Minister. Well, I, I think Willie Ryan should pay attention to the, the response around the chamber for his question. There's 275 officers. There's 275 officers have standing authority to carry firearms uh, at the present moment on, on patrol. Uh, that is out of uh, a total number of police officers uh, in Scotland, thanks to this government, of over uh, 17. A thousand. I think that sense of perspective uh, should be placed into the realm of, of Willie Rennie. Uh, the alternative, of course, uh, to having the uh, efficient operation that the, the Chief Constable has put forward would be delay in these officers being properly equipped to respond to serious incidents. That would not be desirable. The alternative to them not being available for other duties, if any of these 275, and let's remember that is the total, in any one shift it will be a fraction of 275, would be to have a situation where officers uh, were had to drive past incidents that they happened to be first responders to uh, because they were armed officers. That would clearly be both impractical and undesirable. Uh, but, you know, this question of the operational response, every single police board in England, bar one, has exactly the same operational response as the Chief Constable. Every single police board in England, bar one, and I can see Willie Rennie saying, oh, well, that's not uh, our responsibility, but it is an interesting fact, because I would like to know, given that his party is in government in uh, England at the present moment, has he expressed this concern or these fears or these difficulties to his colleagues in government of Westminster, or does he just reserve his hyperbole for coming along to this parliament, expressing unnecessary fears and putting things in a way which is not at all reasonable? It's a serious subject. We should be proud of the way our police service defends the interests of our community. We should have confidence in their operational decisions, and we should regard as a triumph not just the huge decline in recorded crime, but the massive decline in both violent crime and, indeed, in the carrying of firearms. And just for once, maybe Willie Rennie will come to this chamber and give our police the due regard they should have for their success in keeping us safe from harm. Yeah.
question four, Chuck Brody. To ask the First Minister how many houses have been built in the private and public sectors in each of the last three years. First Minister. Latest available figures for the completion of private sector homes are 2011, 10,150, 2012, 9,990, 2013, 9,938. The affordable homes figures include all homes counted towards the government target of 30,000 affordable homes by March 2016. The latest figures are 2011, 6,296. 2012, 6,385, 2013, 7,189, and these figures show that we are well on our way to meeting the 30,000 target, something that will be welcomed across this chamber, although I should point out the figure for 2013 is higher than anything achieved in any year by the Labour Liberal Administration. Yeah. I thank the First Minister for that answer. The Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Kearney, said at the weekend that not enough houses were being built in the UK. Can the First Minister indicate how the record on house building in Scotland compares with the rest of the UK and what action is being taken to boost house building in the private sector? First Minister. Well, I think the Governor of the Bank of England uh, uh, was absolutely right to focus attention on supply in the housing market. And a direct answer to the question, the rate of home completions per 100,000 population for the year to end September 2013 was much higher in Scotland at 268 than in England 202 or Wales 180. And that has been the case throughout the 2007-8 to 2012-13 period. It's particularly marked, of course, in terms of social housing. Uh, where the new build completion rate in Scotland was 80.9 per 100,000 compared to 41 in England, 25 in Wales uh, and 70 in Northern Ireland. One of the reasons that we are experiencing less of the pressure on housing as a housing bubble and across Scotland in generality is our supply of housing statistics are better, but they are not good enough. Uh, and therefore, I think, given the Bank of England and the Governor's initiative, it would be particularly instructive to have a joint look at what we can do with the finances of housing associations in particular, uh, in terms of uh, allowing them to uh, increase the excellent work that they're already doing. Very briefly, Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister if any further reviews will be carried out on Housing Association grants to increase the number of new registered social landlord developments. First Minister. Yes, uh, we are uh, ongoing in our discussions with the, uh, uh, the housing associations, and as Mary Fee has just heard, I think it's one of the keys to uh, avoiding uh, some of the great difficulties we are seeing in some parts uh, of England at the present moment. Uh, and I think also that she would acknowledge as as a fair-minded colleague in this chamber, that these uh, figures for affordable homes uh, are impressive under the circumstances we've experienced uh, over the last few years. And given these circumstances of, uh, of straightened uh, economic times and cutbacks from Westminster are much more severe than anything experienced by the Labour Liberal Administration, it seems particularly impressive that these figures are higher than anything that was achieved by the Labour Party when in office. Question number five, Graham Pearson. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to tackle racial intolerance and hate crime. First well, racist, racial incidents, racist incidents are decreasing. There were 4,628 recorded in 2012-13. That's 30 per cent fewer than in 2006-07. The clear-up rate, which is also crucial, is also improving up 3 per cent. However, there is much, much more to be done. In February, we launched the awareness campaign, Speak Up Against Hate Crime to help victims and witnesses of hate crime to report all incidents to Police Scotland. And we have provided £60 million of funding for a range of equality projects between 2012 and 2015. That's more than double the £28 million the Labour Liberal Democrat Coalition provided between 2004 and 2007. That funding includes over £8 million that we're using to support 40 local and national organisations in their work eh, to break down barriers to racial equality. Uh, I'm, grateful to, I'm grateful to the First Minister for that reply. In that context, can you explain why the Scottish Government is cutting the funding to the only national charity focused on anti-racism by more than two-thirds? The Show the Racism the Red Card charity received funding of £70,000 in 2012-13. It fell to £40,000 last year, and it's intended to be £20,000 this year. First Minister. Well, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that Graham Pearson, perhaps uh, it wasn't what he meant to say, but the, you know, I've got a list here of 40 
uh, local organisations and national organisations across Scotland who, who benefit from the budgets that I've just outlined, which are substantially more than the budgets were allocated when his party were in office. I mean, I'll start reading them if you want. Uh, Access Atmosgar, Amina, Article 12, Bemis, Bridges Programme, Bridging the Gap, the Red Cross, the Coalition for Racial Equality uh, and Rights. Now, I could go on right through the alphabet. The H, well, Graham, Graham Pearson suggested, uh, and I think it may have been a mistake, uh, that there was uh, only one national organisation active in this field. There are many, many organisations who are being supported by the Scottish Government. In terms of the particular organisation he raised, a funding package was agreed with them, was signed up to and agreed. In terms of these other 40, they all do valuable work across Scotland. And nothing should be said that diminishes the work that's being done by these vital organisations, even if it was a mistake or a misapprehension. It's absolutely vital we acknowledge that work because although we've made progress on these issues in Scotland, there is a huge amount still to be done. And as he and I both know, there are people in society who would seek to take advantage of racial divisions and they must be combated in every possible sense in this chamber and at the ballot box. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to promote the value of modern apprenticeships to employers and young people. Well, I was delighted to announce on Sunday that we have again surpassed and reached the target of delivering 25,000 new modern apprenticeships in the last year. We intend to build on the success of the programme uh, by guaranteeing 30,000 opportunities every year by 2020. If we make young people your business, we will continue to encourage employers, particularly small businesses, to realise the benefits that a modern apprenticeship can bring. Briefly, Mr Reedy. Thank the First Minister for that answer. In setting out the Scottish Government's vision for apprenticeships in Scotland, does the First Minister agree that all young people deserve the best possible start in life and that a modern apprenticeship is an ideal opportunity for a young person to gain valuable skills, hands-on work experience and, most crucially, a job upon completion? First Minister. Yes, I do. And there are some key figures to get across with regard to that. We now know that 92% of modern apprentices are in employment after six months after completion of their apprenticeship. Uh, that's a, a highly important uh, figure to, to get across in terms of recruiting young people into the modern apprenticeship programme. Uh, we know and we should uh, articulate the fact that modern apprenticeships are for both genders. Uh, there are now 10,445 women started a modern apprenticeship in 2013-14. That's 41% of all modern apprenticeship starts. It compares with 2,857 uh, back a few years ago, which was only 27 per cent of starts. And therefore, that message that modern apprenticeships are for both men and women is vitally important, as is the message that if you get a modern apprenticeship, then it's a passport to a lifetime's employment. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 100.